Здравейте, нека започваме. Значи, за мен е изключително чест да ви представя последният лектор преди а, за климат на фестивала, който идва от Гърция, доктор Спирос Кациналис, доктор по физико-химия, който е а, водещ на комуникацията и публикациите в а, Крилската асоциация на химиците. Това е човек с доста богат опит в а, комуникация на науката и ако трябва да съм честен, не съм му го казал. Той е един от хората, аз да се, причината аз да се захвана с комуникация на науката. А, ще видите защо, просто наистина невероятен. Пожелавам ви приятна лекция. Uh, one, two, hello. One more round of applause for the translators. Please. Because, you know, I'm stressed, they're going to be angry at me later, you know, so <laughs> I better be nice to them. Um, hi, nice to be here. This is, not my third, this is not my first time in Bulgaria. I was here in the first festival eight years ago. It was next to the British Council in a nice little park. And the year before, I organized with some Bulgarian and Greek scientists a nice debate about nuclear energy, which is a very sensitive topic, I guess, everywhere, okay? So, today I'm not going to be very scientific. I'm going to give you a talk which I hope we can enjoy, a more light talk, okay? Um, let me tell you a few things about the background of this talk. Um, there's, um, I was writing for a popular e-magazine in Greece, so I decided to write this topic after I had coffee with some of my friends, and uh, the cousin of one of the friends was there, and I will tell you in a minute what she said. You know, when you're writing articles as a journalist or as a communicator, every little thing in your everyday life can be a good excuse, you know, a good uh, uh, stimul stimulation to write something new. new. Um, then there is an event in Greece called Days of Rationality. It's running in two cities uh, for the last five years, and they asked me to give a talk there, same topic as today. I said, okay, let's do it. And it turned out to be the most popular uh, topic. It has broken the record for views and downloads, uh, people attending. So I guess when I was invited here in Bulgaria, I thought, well, I should do the same. It was popular in Greece. Maybe it will be nice and popular here. Um, it's a Balkan country, Orthodox country. So I'm guessing, you know, what Greeks like, Bulgarians will like. That's my, my guess, okay? <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm Spiros, I'm working in Greece right now. I've traveled around the world. I was a professor in Japan. I worked in Holland, England, France. Now, I chose the best time to go to Greece <laughs> in the economic crisis. Not a, not a wise choice, but okay. So, um, let me move, okay. So this talk is dedicated to the cousin of my friend, okay? So here's what happened. We go outside for a coffee. You know, in Greece, we like to go outside for coffees and sit for three hours, for four hours. It's a, it's a nightmare, yes, here in Bulgaria too. It's a nightmare for the shop owner, right? Okay. So I'm sitting there, and they start talking about a couple that were going through a divorce, I think. All right? I don't know the couple, so I'm just listening. I'm not uh, interrupting them. I'm not, I'm not participating in the conversation. So the cousin says, well... I'm a rational person. I'm a rational, clever, intelligent person, and I would never do that with my husband. Then two minutes later, she says again, I'm a very rational, intelligent person. This is what I would do if I were her. So she starts giving advices and comments about how to deal with the problems. And to be honest, because I know her a little bit, she is indeed a very clever, intelligent person, successful at her job, successful with her family, so she's not lying, she's a very intelligent person and a very rational person. So I'm listening to them, okay? And then when they finish the conversation about the couple, she says, well, it's expected. He's a rack, she's an oofen, you know, the star signs. You know, she's a Capricorn. She starts talking about zodiacs. I'm like, oh my God, not again. <laughs> zodiacs all the time. It's very, very popular in Greece, probably here in Bulgaria too, right? Uh, we have magazines and newspapers, uh, TV shows about uh, Zodiacs, and it's amazing, yeah? It's amazing because um, 
what I started to realize is that no matter how intelligent the person is, no matter how rational the person is, like my friend's cousin, there's a very, very wide range of things that science has completely um, rejected. No, there's no validation at all, and science is the best tool that we have uh, to decide if something is true or not, if something is sensible or not. And yet, the, the majority of people adopt at least one of those things. Some of them adopt many of those things. So here's a quick list. There's many people in Greece, probably in Bulgaria, that believe in star science, of course, very popular. Science has been very, very uh, certain about that. There's no effect. You know, stop wasting your time and your money on star science, okay? Uh, saints' miracles, okay. You know, physics doesn't hold when it comes to a saint. Ghosts, there are even TV programs that hunt them. Okay. Afterlife, because we have so many, you know, pieces of evidence about that. <laughs> um, crystal therapy. I have a friend of a friend that has a crystal therapy shop in where I live. And her husband uh, has a radio show. And he asked me to take an interview for me. And I said, no, because I cannot come to give an interview for you. And the first thing I will say is that your wife is a charlatan, you know, so I keep my distance. <laughs> Prophecies, so many. This is usually linked to this. <laughs> Visits from aliens, uh, especially in the US. Uh, and the best, which I think my wife suffered from that this morning, uh, the evil eye. Do you have it in Bulgaria, of course, right? Yeah. The evil eye, you don't have it in Bulgaria? I'm shocked. You do, yeah. Yeah, and you wear some little eye to protect, and if you're blue-eyed, you can, you know, <laughs> you have the best defense, and uh, yeah. So she took an aspirin, but that doesn't count, you know. <laughs> so she took an aspirin, but maybe it was the evil eye. So anyway, there's many, many things, and pretty much everyone here, especially here at the festival, will say, if I ask him, do you respect science? Yes. Do you accept science as the best tool we have to seek the truth and answers and gather evidence, blah, 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 blah? Yes, everybody is a rational person here that loves science until it debunks one of his stupid beliefs, right? And everybody has here a stupid belief, a nonsense belief, something that is not based anywhere. So why do we have them? Well, don't worry, I'm here tonight <laughs> to tell you why, <laughs> okay? So... Um, this, this, by the way, is a Greek actor, very, very famous Greek actor. And uh, the reason I put him up there is because in this film, he portrays a politician, Mavro Yalouros, right? And uh, he's the politician that says lies all the time and empty promises. So every time we have one of these politicians in Greece, we have so many, <laughs> um, we, we kind of you know, link him and relate him to Mavro Yalouros. And the reason I, I put him up there is because it's my belief that when you start at a very young age and you start to adopt nonsense, right, and you don't filter them and you don't have any critical analysis of what people tell you and you adopt one thing that is nonsense, second thing that is nonsense, uh, 10, 100, 1,000 things that are nonsense, then politicians have a very, very easy way to fool you because you're not trained into thinking critically, right? So I think, because some people ask me, what's your problem with the zodiacs? We're having a nice, light discussion over our coffee, and Spiros is always there, always there, telling us to stop it. What's your problem, Spiros, with the Zodiacs? I mean, it's harmless, right? Well, according to my ideas, it's not harmless. Because this is how you start, or whatever it is, this is how you start, and eventually, when you have a society that is full of nonsense beliefs, and with no critical thinking, you end up here, okay? you end up here, you end up being fooled by anybody who wants to sell you anything. Okay, so more rational thinking, I think it's kind of a defense that we can have against charlatans and against bad politicians. But that's my idea, that's my, my view. So, uh, I think tonight's talk can be very well summarized. If I can summarize it with one sentence, then is this. Everyone respects science until it debunks one of their beliefs. Okay, so yes, we rely on science for everything, 
But the moment science touches something you don't want to be touched, you go, oh, come on, scientists, you don't know everything, you know. <laughs> okay? But the, rea the reality is that what we know is through science. And what we don't know today, and there's so many things that we don't know, tomorrow, maybe we will know them again through science. We will not know them through prophecies or crystals or zodiacs, okay? This has been tested again and again and again, and it doesn't work. So let's see why, why we adopt them even if we know they don't work. So I have pretty much four categories of causes, okay? Let's start with the first one. We don't see the full picture. Um, it's easy for us to draw conclusions without actually looking for the whole package of information, okay? We can get carried away, we can be easily impressed, and when we get impressed, we stay at that point where we're impressed. We don't see what the rest of the story says. Let me give you some examples. They are very, very small and simple examples, but they can pass the message. Okay, what if I told you that in England, a woman gave birth to her eighth, number eight, eighth son in a row, okay? If you saw that on a newspaper, you'd be like, wow, yes, that's impressive. She had eight kids and eight of them are sons. Wow, what are the chances? Amazing, right? We should put it on a tabloid like the sun. Okay, let's look at the numbers. In England, you have 700,000 births per year. 1,000 of those women will give birth to their eighth child. Okay? Now, what do uh, mathematics tell us? What are the probabilities that all eight of them are boys? One over two times one over two times, you do that eight times, is one in 256. So for the thousand women in Britain that will have their eighth child, four of them should have eight boys. So the real news should be, oh my God, this year nobody have eight boys in a row. <laughs> but we choose uh, selectively some piece of information and we get carried away. So, um, by looking at the big picture, we can avoid being impressed for the wrong reasons. Let me, let me give you another example. Um, somebody tells you that she has a boy, a, a mother, okay? A mother tells you, I have a boy, and I have another child. It doesn't matter what's the, um, uh, the sequence, if the boy is the first or the second. It just has a boy. And then I have another child. What are the chances that the other, boy is, the, other, the other child is also a boy? Most people would say, instinctively, 50%, right? I mean, it has to be, the other kid has to be either a boy or a girl. So, 50%. That's the wrong answer. Who can tell me what's the right answer? Okay, it's 33%. Because if you look at all the scenarios, boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl, Okay, girl, girl is not part of the problem. So from the other three, boy, boy is one in three. So 33% chance the other is a boy too. Simple, right? But what does it tell us? It tells us that if we don't look the big picture, it's easy to give the wrong answer. And that was a very, 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 very simple example. You can imagine with more complicated problems how easy it is to jump to the wrong conclusion. Because people don't know and they prefer to say something than just say, I don't know, or I will look for the information, okay? One more test, because I know you like tests. Do you know the Monty Hall problem? The Monty Hall problem, okay, I'm sure you've seen it on TV, it's, every country has it. It's the game show where they give you three doors, door number one, door number two, no, door number three. One of them has an expensive car, the other two have nothing, okay? And you choose door number one. So the presenter, Spiros, goes, okay, let's see what was behind door number three. So I open the door, and there's nothing. So there's two doors left, the one you chose and number two. How many of you, and then I give you the option, you can change your decision. You still want the same choice, or do you want to change it? How many of you would change? How many of you stay with your first decision? Much more, okay? That's healthy. You're wrong, <laughs> but that's the normal thing to be wrong. Most people say, well, I'm on the right track, right? I mean, I chose number one, 
number three was wrong, so probably I'm on the right track. And you know, you don't want to switch and then lose, then you hit your head on the wall, right? But mathematics tells us you should switch all the time. Why? And don't argue with me, because every time I say that to a friend of mine, he wants to hit me. <laughs> you know? But I'm, I'm telling you, I promise you, it's the right thing, what I'm going to say to you. Because before, you had, when you choose your door, it's 33%. 66% was on the other two doors. I just showed you that there's nothing on number three, so that 66 is now number two. So if you switch, you double your chances of being correct. And if you find it hard to understand that, hard to accept it with three doors, imagine the same problem with a thousand doors or a hundred. So you choose one of the, of, of the hundred, and then I open 98 doors. I mean, the chances are that the door left is where the price is, not the one you chose um, originally. So what I'm trying to say with these very, very simple examples is that if we don't think about all the scenarios, if we don't think about all the numbers and possibilities included, it's easy for us to respond with an instinct that is wrong. Our instinct is very, very often very wrong. Uh, that's the example that I just gave you. So in Britain, which is large number of birds. I mean, Britain has like 60 million people, okay? In Bulgaria and Greece, it will be much smaller. The second category is what I call the confirmation bias. It's more psychological. Again, it's about not seeing the big picture, but this time, we do it on purpose, because that's convenient for us, okay? We see what we want to see. Okay, the first case, you know, not seeing the whole picture is because actually we don't know. We don't know, or we don't think about um, the numbers. But here, sometimes, with the confirmation bias, which is a very general term in psychology, and there's so many different biases, um, we selectively, we, we, we make, a, we make a, um, I should say, emotional selection, an emotional choice, and then we keep only the piece of information that is what we want it to be. Okay, let me give you my favorite example. I say that to Anna all the time. Um, the phone, okay? So now I'm thinking of Lyubov, okay? I haven't seen Lyubov for two years. I haven't spoken to Lyubov for two years. And then I'm thinking of Lyubov. Oh, I wonder, how's Lyubov? Is she in Sofia? Yeah, I wonder if she's okay. Phone rings. Oh my God, Lyubov, is that you? I was just thinking about you, right? And we're all impressed, okay? If that happens to you, you're impressed. You're like, oh my God. Oh, this is not, you know, science doesn't know everything, right? <laughs> the universe is much more mysterious and magical than science tells us. Because what just happened is amazing, right? Well, it's not actually amazing because I've thought about a hundred people in the last few weeks that I haven't seen for years, the phone never rang. Uh, the phone rang many times and it wasn't the person I was thinking. So maybe this thing happened a thousand times. If one time it is the person that we're thinking, that's the piece of information that we keep, okay? You break up with your girlfriend, you go to a hundred bars, don't see her, but if you see her in one of those hundred bars, you're like, oh, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> but it is a coincidence. We don't see the big picture. We keep selectively the information that we want to keep. This is why people, it's so hard for them to change their mind about politics, okay? They make an emotional choice. I'm going to vote for that Bulgarian party because they promised me this, they promised me that, and they are very proud of our country, blah, 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 blah. And then maybe it's the worst party ever the worst party ever, but we don't change our mind easily because we keep only that piece of information that is um, telling us, no, no, you made the right choice. You see that with shopping, right? You know, you don't want which pair of shoes you want to buy. You have three choices, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Then you choose and you go home and you're thinking only of those pieces of information that tells you, yes, you bought the right pair of shoes. We don't want to, 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 to feel wrong, okay? So this selective this selective filtering of the information and the available data is what we call confirmation bias. We have, made, we have made already a choice, and then we keep only what's convenient for us. There is a very popular conspiracy theory in Greece. I don't know if you have it in, in Bulgaria. Every December, the governing body of the lottery in Greece, we call it OPAP. This is the people running all the uh, lucky games. Every December, they have designed they have rigged the games. So there's three jackpots. So then at Christmas Day, we can all go and spend our money because it's great to win on Christmas the jackpot. 
and they do it on December. And then I tell them, wait a minute, OPAP has all the results on the website. If you go on the website, if you're strange enough like me to go on the website and look for Excel files, uh, you find the Excel file, look at that. In 2016, you had 140 lotteries, 87 times was a jackpot. In 2015, the same, 104 lotteries, a jackpot in 88 times. 2014, 84 times. So around 8 in 10, in 10 times throughout the year, every month, it's a jackpot. So it's nothing strange about a jackpot in December. But if you really, really, really want to believe that OPAP has designed this conspiracy to steal your money, that's what you're going to believe. You don't see the rest of the year. In fact, you can take them the Excel files, you can show them the Excel files, they're not going to look at them. I'm sure, you know, it has happened to me with friends. I tell them, this, here's the data. Do you want to see the data? But because the data will give him a different picture, he refuses to look at it. He's happy with his conspiracy. People are happy with their conspiracies, okay? But it's a, it's a bias, it's a confirmation bias. It's, 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 uh, it's selectively filtering the information, okay? So this is a very, very popular conspiracy in Greece, the Christmas lottery conspiracy. Um, what else do we have here? The dreams, okay? I've, I've written a book about dreams, and in fact, my first visit in Sofia eight years ago, that's the topic uh, of the talk I gave. It was the, uh, the Science of Dreams, the little book that I wrote. And um, I read a lot of things about dreams and um, uh, what's the interpretations by psychologists and neuroscientists. And an interesting thing is the, the, the first question people ask me is, oh, are dreams prophetic? Do they tell us the truth? And it's, it's an interesting topic because you can have a thousand dreams and they could be nonsense. And one of them, one of them by coincidence, could match a later event. Now, the person that had that dream, it will be very hard for him to, to convince him that it's not a coincidence, you know? We dream every night. So in a year, you have 300 dreams. In three years, you have 1,000 dreams. But if one or two match, by coincidence, a later event, that's it. It's prophetic. Special powers. Special powers. Okay? So, yeah, dreams... Uh, I, I was reading that um, uh, Freud, which was like the first person that actually turned dreams into a scientific tool and wrote the book, uh, The Interpretation of Dreams, I think, more than 100 years ago. Uh, he said that usually I don't care what my patient says because the dream has no coherence. We try to create the coherence when we wake up. So we see images, we see strange things, and then we wake up and we make a story, okay? So for Freud, um, symbols was the most important thing. So he didn't pay any attention to the story because he knew it was fabricated, okay? But dreams is a very good example of how people can take a coincidence and make it into a belief, okay? And then we have what I call, I don't know if in psychology there's a term for that, but I call it casism. Okay, let, let this be documented in Sofia. That's my term, okay? Casism. So you take one case and you make a big uh, conclusion out of it. And you've seen that in your lives, in your everyday lives, many times. Let me give you a few examples which I'm sure, I'm sure happened to you. My grandfather smoked and reached the age of 95. So smoking is okay, right? My grandfather reached this. So we don't care that science has shown us with research that smokers live 10 to 15 years less. That's science, that's data. That's millions and millions of pieces of data. But if your grandfather smoked and reached the age of 95, that's good enough for me, okay? So we take, it's very dangerous. You know, when, when you talk about products on TV, uh, your mother bought a cream, your brother bought this, and they tell you, no, no, I have a cousin. Stop the conversation there. What happened to one person has no valid validation at all. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the danger of charlatanism. Most charlatans will sell you stuff you cannot measure. Remember that next time. And what do they say? Oh, we asked 10 people and 10 people gave us their experience. But that's not something you can measure. If you can measure it, sure, I'll look at the data, you can convince me. But if it's something that is based on personal experience, that's getting suspicious, okay? Uh, my aunt recovered consuming honey and cinnamon, what pharma doesn't want you to know. So all the big pharmaceuticals, the evil, 
They just want to give you poison and take your money. But if you eat honey every day, you can cure cancer. It's very popular in Greece now. Many websites, they tell you, take this from your grandmother's shelf. Maybe if you got sick 20 times and you took honey and cinnamon, maybe two or three times you got better. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe the virus completed its cycle. But what about the rest of the time when it didn't work? If you are absolutely convinced that honey is what Big Pharma is afraid of, then that's what you're going to believe. It's a, it's, a case, it's a casism example as well. My best friend earned money the day his star sign said he would. So one of 12 people here has the same star sign. Okay? I'm a Gemini. I'm sure there's many Geminis here. So if I win money because my star sign said so, it means everybody who's a Gemini should win money. Of course, that's ridiculous, okay? Uh, my cousin, this is very popular in Greece, my cousin got pregnant after she visited the monastery, you know? <laughs> They go to the monastery, they light a candle, and it's like, please help me get pregnant. That's not going to help you. Something else is going to help you, probably, but that's not, that's not it. But let's imagine a hundred women go, a hundred women go, and ten of them get pregnant. Because it happens. You know, everybody who has kids knows that psychology can change. You know, it could be luck. It could be so many different parameters, okay? Gynecologists, gynecologists will tell you that there's so many parameters. And uh, this, I know people that had difficulty getting a child. They pay so much money to the doctors for, how do you call them? Uh, uh, I, I don't remember the term right now. And then the second child came really easily. So it can happen. So from the 100 women that went to the monastery, if 10 of them got pregnant, bang. That's good money for the monastery. Everybody else will also visit. So I, I, I know I'm in a Balkan Orthodox country. I come from a Balkan Orthodox country, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on thin ice right now, but okay, <laughs> you can catch me later. <laughs> so, look at how many biases the brain has. I'm not an expert to go through all of them, and even if I wanted, I probably cannot read them, <laughs> so many. But what this shows us is that it's very, very easy to fool our brain, okay? It's very easy to fool our brain. Um, but sometimes, or I can say many times, we voluntarily fool our brain because we want to hear what we want to hear. Okay, um, somebody mentioned this afternoon in another talk, Skinner. Skinner did a very famous experiment now, uh, very simple experiment, but it, it tells you a lot. He put pigeons in boxes, right? And um, he was giving food to the pigeons at very random moments. And what he found out over time is that the pigeons adopted certain moves, like moving of the movement of the head or movement of their body, uh, because the pigeons actually correlated the food with the movement they did. And this is actually very, very similar to how humans behave also. You know, you know, all these uh, prejudices that we have, you know, like touch wood and uh, little things that we do because we believe it will bring us luck or it will uh, um, get rid of the bad luck. It's not so, it's not so dissimilar than this uh, behavior. The pigeon doesn't know food comes randomly. The pigeon thinks, oh, I did three times my head like this, and the food came, so I will do it again. So we make arbitrary connections, and this is the basis, one of the bases for uh, many prejudices that we have. So let's go to the third category, evolutionary reasons. So it's not all just our choices. Some of the things are written in our brains, okay? So imagine 100,000 years ago, you are in the darkness, in a savanna, and you hear a noise. And you can assume that this noise was just air through, um, through a tree, or it's a lion, and the lion will eat you. You don't have the luxury of gathering data. You will make a quick choice, and that quick choice will have to minimize your risk. And we're talking about the ultimate risk, your own life. So maybe we were evolved in such a way as to not make always rational decisions, but to make quick decisions that will lower the risk. Um, yeah, sometimes you have zero evidence, but, but it's good. And then you have the social conformity. Now, let's say I speak with 10 people later, and they're very angry at me because I said something bad about uh, religion or uh, political party. Okay, I can live with that. You know, I have fights with my family and my friends all the time about politics and religions. Um, it's not a big deal, okay? But imagine 100,000 years ago, if you had the same fight with the other nine people in the cave, 
you know, you don't want to be kicked out of the cave. <laughs> the risk is much higher, okay? So um, what we think is that social conformity is, is much more important than actual accuracy. So if you have to choose between survival and accuracy, if you have to choose between, hey, I'm right, look at the data, you are all wrong, and come on, out. <laughs> You're ruining the atmosphere. Uh, people will conform because they want to survive. So sometimes they will sacrifice their opinions, they will sacrifice the data because, you know, social conformity. And you may think, well, yeah, but that's something that happened in a cave, and we don't know if it's true today. Mm -hmm. and, and indeed, we have experiments that show that it's true today. And again, this afternoon, uh, Didri, the speaker, mentioned this experiment. Uh, it happened in 1951 in the USA. Um, it's ridiculous. It's so beautiful, but it's so ridiculous. They asked people, I mean, everybody was in the trick, okay? One, everybody was a volunteer. It was one person being examined. So they asked people, this line, um, what is it closer to from those three? I mean, the obvious answer is A, right? And everybody would say A. But what they did is they tried to trick this person. Everybody else gave the wrong answer, you know, on purpose. So everybody said, no, it's B, you know, it's C. And in 75% of the cases, the person that gave the obvious correct answer changed his answer because he wanted to conform to the, uh, to the rest of the group. Now, that's a very simple experiment. It's a very simple procedure, but it tells, them, it tells us something really, really interesting, right? How powerful peer pressure and social conformity can be, not just in the cave era, but even today. But like I said, when it comes to a cave, it's even more uh, um, important for your survival. Um, I found a paper recently which said that, you know, even atheism is not linked to, uh, uh, to the brain or to the critical thinking, but to peer pressure and social upbringing and education. It's, it's all interesting stuff. Uh, popular wisdom, you know, um, in Greece, if grandma said something, that's it, it's the Bible. Grandma says they have the ultimate wisdom. Um, but how many times have we actually sat down and thought, well, my grandma said 20 things. Five of them were correct, 15 were nonsense. No. It's again confirmation bias, it's selective uh, thinking. We don't want to question the elder wisdom, okay? So we think that everything the elders say is, is, is correct, but it's not. It's not. But it's difficult. It's difficult to debunk popular wisdom because it's not a specific source or a specific person that says that. It's the collective wisdom, and it's difficult to go against that collective, collective wisdom. And when you do, usually, get out of the cave. <laughs> so, um, the last part, my last category, so we talked about not knowing the full picture, we talked about psychological reasons, confirmation bias, we keep only the information that we want to keep. Uh, we talked about the third category, which is uh, basically uh, evolutionary, you know, our, our need to conform, to conform to society or to a group. And then the final one is um, basic human weakness that we all have. You know, we are afraid of the future, we are afraid of death, we are afraid of many things, we are afraid of the chaos around us. So we will grab onto anything, anything that will give us uh, some sort of comfort. Maybe because it will tell us that you can control your destiny. Or the opposite, maybe because it will tell us, don't worry, it's out of your hands. Somebody else makes, it, makes the shots. Uh, the Bilderberg Society, the Freemasons, uh, there's so many different theories, right? And people that are too weak to accept that they have no control, or because they want to have control, they will easily adopt this nonsense because it will give them comfort, right? So, let's have uh, uh, one example of this. Um, I don't know how popular they are here, but like astrologers, they're somewhat popular in Greece, especially in previous decades, and they use very good tricks. If you know the tricks, it's fun. I'll go through them quickly, but um, um, it's, it, it's interesting how they can um, manipulate people and take advantage of their need, of their need to hear certain things. So, for example, they have these uh, rainbow statements, or they call them also Barnum and Fuller. I think these names are psychologists that conducted experiments that, has, that have proved that all that are in astrology and elsewhere, they're nonsense. But uh, it's difficult to convince people. Uh, what are the rainbow statements? They are designed statements 
that show that it's personal. So I can say the same things to everybody here in the audience, and everybody will think, oh, this is, this is totally me. Oh, it's, it's like you know me. Of course I know you. I speak with spirits, you know? Um, but it's designed to make it look like it's for you, and also it is designed to cover the entire spectrum of a human behavior. So, for example, I can say, uh, you're a very positive person, very nice person, but sometimes you get angry at people. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> so, what do I achieve like that? First of all, I make you feel good, because I'm making a compliment to you. I'm calling you a very nice person. And then I make it look like I know details about your life. Because although you are a positive person, sometimes you get angry and you think, this is me, this is totally me. My husband would say that about me. How do you know me? Um, you're not self-centered, but sometimes you want people to recognize your effort. Okay? Um, you're a very, very honest person, but sometimes you lie to protect the people that you love. Oh my God, this is totally me. You're right. That's exactly what I do. And people are convinced that this person is talking about themselves, right? So these are, these are you know, I could say almost like science, you know, <laughs> designed. Um, then there's fishing or cold reading. So it's like saying here, okay, I sense, I sense in this audience, and hey, maybe I'll do that for a living <laughs> after the festival. I sense in this audience the name, the name Ivan, the name Ivan, right? Does it ring a bell for somebody here? Is, is Ivan important for somebody here? Yeah, come on, it's easy, right? We are in Bulgaria. If I was in Greece, I would say Dimitri or Yorgos, which are the popular. Georgi is here also, right? Maria, somebody might. Maybe I can say, I feel, well, this is wonderful, I'm getting into the role. Um, I feel, yeah, it's like the movies, right? They, they usually have a microphone, you know, and a big audience. I feel somebody here is still hurt by the loss of a loved one. Somebody lost somebody recently. I mean, there's so many people here, so many families. Some family had a tragic loss recently. So this is, this is cold reading. This is fishing. I'm fishing for information. And then the lady responds, yes. And I'm like, oh, here we are. Okay, let's go. So I can spot the weak people that really want to believe that. And then I can start working on them. An examination is coming up here for somebody. I feel it. The spirits tell me that an examination is taking place. Examination could be for a car license, for school, for university, for a medical checkup. It could be so many different things. But I use one word and I make my life easy, right? Not for five lever, more, okay? <laughs> um, so, um, there's a whole range of, of tactics these people use, okay? And it's usually with our help because we all have the same fears, we all have the same agonies in this life. We feel sometimes helpless, we feel sometimes without purpose. What happens when I die? What happened to my mother when she died? I have no control, I have no money, and I want a sign to tell me that tomorrow my finances will be uh, again okay. So we're looking for things to make us feel better. We're looking for things to, to, to make us feel that we made the right choice. So all these things are things that either our brain uh, can fool itself, or other people can fool us with. Um, so, the more that we know about these things, the easier it is to defend ourselves against nonsense and charlatans and bad politicians and bad businessmen. Uh, but there's specific things that we can do. I mean, you know, what's, what's our responsibility? There's three things we can do. Uh, remember the first thing I said is, we don't know the full picture, we don't know everything. And people don't like to show that they don't know everything, you know? Usually we ridicule people that don't know everything. So I think that has to change. Um, we have to, our responsibility is we have to change the way we react to the I don't know. I think that it's, it's, it's a very honest thing and a very honorable thing to be in a conversation and when they ask you something to say, I don't know. Tell me or I will look for it later. It's a very common human nature to have an opinion about everything. And that's the beginning of the problem. If, if everybody has a beginning, uh, if everybody has an opinion about everything, then it's very, very difficult to actually do the work, to actually go and look what is the right answer. So, in order for that to happen, we have to change our reaction to the I don't know. You know usually we ridicule people that don't know. Um, I think that we should change this attitude and we should say, okay, it's great that you admit you don't know, because that's the first step towards knowledge, to admit that actually I don't know the full picture. And if you have this kind of attitude towards information, 
then it will be much easier for you to see the whole picture and avoid the mistakes. The second thing is, we have to put the effort. Our responsibility is how to promote the knowledge. Uh, I'm a scientist. I love science. It's my passion from when I was 10. But believe me, I don't like attending most scientific talks. I don't, because they're boring. They're really, really boring. And most people in science confuse two things. They think that interesting means attractive. And you have to separate these two things. Cancer research is interesting. But if I have a choice to listen to a professor about cancer research on Friday night or go for a drink with my wife, I'll go for a drink with my wife. I want to do something fun. So just because something is interesting for you or just because something is important for humanity doesn't mean that people will spend their time listening to you. We have to make it more fun, more attractive, so we can attract more and more um, percentages of the general population. This is a responsibility for all teachers, educators, professors, science communicators. We have a very, very big responsibility of how we give this knowledge to the people above to the people that say, I don't know, but I want to find out. Next time, I want to have an informed opinion, not what my grandmother said, okay? And finally, we have to start changing our way of thinking, and we have to ch start changing the way we raise our children. Because one of the problems is that, you remember that first slide I showed you, that, you know, everybody thinks he's a rational person, that they respect science, but we all adopt nonsense, all right? So imagine you have a small kid in the house. I, I have two boys, two little boys. Imagine if from the age of three, when you first start your conversations with them, until they go to the age of 18, you bombard them with nonsense. Star signs, miracles, crystal therapies, conspiracies, all this nonsense that we discussed today, I bombard my children with them. What do I expect to happen when they go 20 years old, 25? Will they be critical thinkers? Probably not. Because, you know, the hard work happens when you're young. If you go to the age of 18 and 20 and you already believe in all this nonsense, it's really, really hard to let go of all these things. So before we wait from society or from television or from school to do all this work, let's start this work in our houses, okay? So we have a responsibility about um, all these things. And like I said, it may seem harmless to talk about star signs over coffee, but they're all interconnected. These things are all related to what kind of citizens we have and what kind of citizens we will create later on. So when the election comes and you see everybody voting for the most crazy people, it's not a surprise, right? Come on, they believed so many other things, why not him, okay? So let's think about how rational we really are. Let's see how, ra how rational we believe we are. Let's see why is there a difference. And I think, you know, from, from these kind of exercises and the, from this kind of thinking, uh, we can reach a kind of self-improvement. And when you reach a self-improvement, you also reach, you know, a collective improvement of society. I think it's important because it's not just about buying the right shoes or not spending time on zodiacs. It's about making really important decisions when you're adults for the society. And that's why science communication is important, because sooner or later we'll make decisions about our food, about our energy, about so many different things. And in order to make good collective decisions, first of all, we have to be informed. And secondly, we have to uh, adopt critical thinking. And critical thinking will be helped when we recognize all these reasons that make all of us little or more irrational. Thank you very much. What time is it? Um, FameLab, Bulgarian FameLab will take place next door. So if you want to catch that, you should go now. Um, Maybe I should take some questions, or maybe you can find me in the corridors. I don't know what the organizers think. I don't know if somebody wants to have a question. Ah, the gentleman here has a question. Maybe one or two questions, because we all want to go next door. Actually, I'm giving a second presentation in the break of Family Lab, so please come there, too. Ah, the gentleman has a question here. Uh, 
thank you for your presentation. And my question is, uh, do you think that everything relies on statistics and science? Um, statistics can be very, very tricky. You know, there's a saying that says that lies, damn lies, and statistics. And we don't know who actually said that first. There's a debate about whether a politician said it or uh, an author. But yes, I do believe that um, science is not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's the best tool that we have as humanity. I mean, if in the next hundred years we come up with a better tool, okay, let's adopt the new, the new tool. But right now, over the centuries and over the millennia, the reason that na right now we have science festivals and we live to the age of 80 and we have good health and we have better food and we go to space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is down to science, nothing else. No, none of these people that claim that have contact with the spirits and alternative uh, methods to heal you and all, all these things that, we, that I mentioned in my talk, none of these people contributed anything actually that worked. And if it worked, science would find out if it works, it would probably find out the method and it will be part of the scientific method. It's what uh, Tim Minchin said, the um, English comedian. He said, do you, know how you call, do you know how we call alternative medicine that actually works? Medicine, that's right. It will become part, it will become part. You think big pharma is for profit? I agree with you. All big companies want profit. Do you think that if some of these things worked, they wouldn't take advantage of them? They would take advantage of them before we even have a discussion here. Yeah. But it's not perfect, and I have many, many examples in history where science was wrong, where science caused tragedies, the thalidomide case in the 60s, nuclear disasters, many times. But this is, uh, this is about us and how we use science as a tool, and also science has something else that is great. It can self-improve. When you look at some of those charlatans, like the astrologers, they tell you the same story of a the last 100, 200, 300 years, nothing changes. If you look at science, look at science 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 21st century, it, it constantly progresses because it constantly recognizes the weaknesses, the mistakes, and it tries to, 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 um, uh, to correct them. If I, if I publish a paper on something and there's mistakes in it, make no mistake, there are thousands of scientists out there that will find my mistake and they will correct me and probably I will lose my job. There's been many cases where people have committed suicide because they fabricated the results and other scientists found out about them. In Korea, in Japan, there's many cases. Do you think uh, you will see that from the group of astrologers? Do you think a hundred astrologers will come and say, this astrologer is using the wrong data? No. They're all in it for the money and they support each other and they cover each other. But in science, in science, nothing will remain a secret for a long time. Eventually, some other scientists will find out because that's the, that's the essence of science. That's something that I do in Athens, a Bulgarian scientist has to reproduce it in Sofia. If he cannot reproduce it, reproduce it something is wrong. That's the essence of science. Uh, yeah. There's many there, but yeah. <coughs> maybe we should take one more question because we have to go to FameLab, and I apologize for the rush. So, do you think that there are sciences that are, let's say, more scientific and some that are more like a pseudo-scientific or not del that deterministic? Yeah, yeah like, of course, there's for many. For example, we have maths and physics, but we have also macroeconomics, we have yeah, of psychology. Yeah, of course. What do you think about of that? Of course, there's hard science where, you know, data is more, uh, uh, more specific, and then you have um, social science, which tries to reproduce. I mean, there's a great video of uh, Richard Feynman on YouTube that talks about these things. They try, to, they try to adopt the scientific method, the methods of physics and chemistry and biology, but they're not as successful. We don't yet have laws in social science that are as, as, as valid and as strong as you have in physics, you know? Because you deal with humans, it's not the same thing. And when you deal with humans, you deal with the human brain, and if anybody tells you that they have certainties about the human brain, that's a very suspicious thing to say. You know, the big, the big unknown ocean is the space and this brain. So we have to be very careful about what we discuss about the brain. Very careful. So I have to apologize for the rush. We have to go next door because I'm also giving a presentation there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.